Do you have Facebook up yet? Working on it. Okay. Yeah, Facebook's up. Oh. Matt, I have a question for you. Yes, indeed. Um, I had talked with you a few weeks ago about organizing some of the music that's on the in the back and stuff. Do you yeah. have time to talk about that maybe this afternoon a little more in detail? Sure. Okay. Great. Um uh do you wanna yep, that'll be great. Um yeah, I'll, we'll I'll figure be, it out, right? Okay, great. Okay. Or if you want to come organize things, I have a whole house right now that could get organized. <laughs> I'm sorry, Diane, what was that? <laughs> I said, if you want to organize things, I have a whole house right now that you're organizing. <laughs> well, it looks like we have a whole sanctuary we could spread out in. <laughs> we could Marie Kondo it up. <laughs> yeah, okay, great. Good morning, Michelle. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Good morning, Hi. Michelle. Hello, everyone. Hi, everyone. Good morning, Good morning. Can people hear me? Yes, yes, yes can indeed. You. Can you see me? Yes, we can. I can't see me. Where? Oh, where? Oh, we see you fine. Well, that's good. I guess that's good. Maybe it's better if you didn't. <laughs> you look okay. Oh. Well, that's good. <laughs> morning Beth welcome good morning all nice to see you Hi, Beth. Beth. Well, there I am okay. hey you see everybody else oh. So I don't know if this is a good time to say hello before you get started. My name's Dee. I'm joining for the first time. So just wanted to welcome. Thank you. Dee. Welcome. Good morning, Dee. Welcome. Wonderful to meet you, Dee. Where are you joining us from? From Auburn. My husband and I are living out in the assisted living out at Brookdale. And uh, mm -hmm. I'm starting to feel the need to reconnect with 
folks who are interested in justice issues and we were married you are in the years right ago place. Anyway. Uh, pardon? You are in the right place. <laughs> That's what I mean. Yeah. We, we were married 41 years ago in a Unitarian Universalist church. So that's our. Oh, very nice. Way to start it right. <laughs> Which church, D? It was out in Springfield. If you Charlie Slap, he was an awesome guy out there for a while. Yes, he was. Everybody's pretty quiet. It's too cold to talk. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't see anybody with um, parkas on or anything like that or or no hats. Yeah. You know, you know. Yes, everybody has oh, heat. That's well, my good. We all have off, heat. But it's cool where I am. I got a jacket. I, I barely have heat. Oh, oh no. I have sunshine in my face. I barely have heat also. There you go, Matt. There is someone. Oh, I got to get the heat on in here. <laughs> the Arctic wind just started. Bruce, the other person you're going to highlight this morning is David Showalter. Yeah, I saw it. I have the order of service up. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. yes. Great. Mm -hmm. We can hear you. We just can't see you, David. He's hiding. Yeah, I'll, I'll fix that when it comes time. So the MLK breakfast ended up being totally online then this year? Yeah, they moved it online about a week ago. Uh -huh. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah. You don't need 1,200 people meeting together. No. Is that how many it was? I, it tells an awful lot of people who go That's to that thing. It has been in the past, yeah. <laughs> I've always enjoyed going. It's been wonderful. And, and even for steam table food, just yeah, all the kids and everything's great. For me, it's like a, a time of the year when you see kind of everyone like in leadership positions across Worcester aspiring to doing better, you know, which is kind of a nice, a nice thing. It you know, to be to be all in the same direction. You know, even if people aren't perfect, you know, they're still aspiring. They're still kind of trying to move that direction. Yep. Come on, John, get out of bed. It's time for church. Well, it's 10 o'clock. Yep. You can finish this round and then go to bat. Okay, you got it. Good morning, David. Is Cooper with you today?
Our chalice lighting this morning are the words of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. We light our chalice this morning remembering these words. Darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. Tonight, um, tonight and only tonight as, as a real uh, a unique thing for us, um, I. I want to introduce some, some really remarkable uh, singers from, from Charleston, South Carolina. It's a beautiful choir. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I want to introduce this, this beautiful choir uh, who, have, who have helped us all uh, so much to, to begin um, healing, if that's possible, following the, the tragic uh, events at Mother Emanuel in Charleston. Uh, please welcome, just an incredible thing for us, uh, please welcome the Low Country Voices. Passage through the darkness and the mist. Though the 
Nobody sleeps the heart will never rest. Oh, let us turn our thoughts today to March to Luther King. And recognize that there are ties between us. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Worcester's online Sunday morning worship service. We are glad that you have joined us virtually this morning. It is an act of love that we gather in this way once again during this time of pandemic response. We begin by that in Worcester, Massachusetts, we work, learn, live, and worship on the seized ancestral homeland of the Nipmunk people who survive and remain active as the Nipmuc Nation. We hope that this service gives you an opportunity to pause for a few minutes to gather in community so that we might care for each other, take a moment to reflect on our own well being, discover opportunities for spiritual refreshment and service in the wider world, even as we are at a personal distance. We gather this way this morning in solidarity with those families in our community who have been exposed or diagnosed with COVID-19 in recent days. The health and safety team met this week to assess plans for the coming weeks and is recommending that UUCW go online only for worship and RE during the month of January. So that we might come to know you better, as you are able, please list your name on your video feed. Know that this service is being live streamed on Facebook and is being recorded for future availability on the church's YouTube channel, as well as our website uh, worship service. Following the service this morning, you are invited for virtual fellowship hour. Once again, welcome to you for joining us this morning. So my name is Diane Mann. I wanted to speak to you this morning as one of the leaders of our Afghan immigrant resettlement team, Team Allyship. Team Allyship is an ecumenical group made up of people from UUCW, Emmanuel Lutheran in Holden and Beth Israel in Worcester. We are dedicated to helping our Afghan friends who had to leave their country with little notice resettle in the United States. Last week, we began to help the Noor family. They are a family of 12 that were met at Bradley Airport by our members on Tuesday evening. They are staying temporarily in an Airbnb. At this time, we need a little more money. A family of 12 has a lot of needs. Also, we are in dire need of a home for them. If you have any leads on a potential home, please contact either Marilyn Martin or me. Thank you for all your support over the past week to help the Noor family take some initial steps. Look for a fundraising link in the message. And thank you. I know you're asking today, how long will it take? Somebody's asking, how long will prejudice blind the visions of men? I come to say to you this afternoon, however difficult the moment, yes, sir. however frustrating the hour, it will not be long no, because truth crushed earth will rise again. Yes, sir. How long, not long. 
Yes, sir. Because no lie can live forever. Yes, sir. How long? Not long. How long? Yes, because you shall reap what you sow. Yes, sir. How long? How long? Not long. How long? Do forever on the scaffold, wrong forever on the throne. Yes, sir. Yet that scaffold sways the future. Yes, Behind the dim unknown standeth God within the shadow, keeping watch above his own. How long? Not long. Because the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. Yes, sir. How long? Not, Not long. Not long. Because mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Yes, sir. He's trampling out the village where the grapes of wrath are stored. Yes, sir. Yeah. He's loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword. Yes, sir. His truth is marching on. Yes, sir. He has sounded forth the trumpet that shall never call retreat. He is sifting out the hearts of men before his judgment seat. Yes, oh, be swift, my soul, to answer him. Be jubilant, my feet. Our God is marching on. Yeah. Glory, hallelujah. Yes, Glory, hallelujah. Please join together in the place where you are viewing our opening hymn number 199 from Service of the, uh, Singing the Living Tradition, Precious Lord, Take My Hand, performed by Mahalia Jackson.
to welcome Robin Mitskevich to share with us our religious exploration moment this morning. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, Robin. Oh, there she is. Good morning, everyone. This is my superhero power mode. I am Robin Mitskevich, your religious exploration director, but I am known this morning as the UU principle number one woman. That's my superhero. And I like to see the inherent worth and dignity in every person. And I can better do that with my superhero spectacles on. But this morning in Religious Exploration, we listened to an amazing podcast by a nine-year-old who is a activist and trying to raise awareness of racism in the country. Uh, he runs a podcast and called The Activators. And he, we listened to his first interview by a young man named um, Cohen, who is the nine-year-old CEO of a foundation against um, racism, where he gets books with racially diverse characters in them to, into schools and libraries, hoping to end um, widespread racism in this country. Um, and each child spoke about what they, their superpowers could be to help in this work that is so important to us today. Um, so with the light of inside of each of us, let us be inspired to use our powers to help and not to harm, to heal and not to hinder, and to bless and not to curse. Thank you. Morning, everybody. Um, folks may be aware of um, our intent to have eighth principle moments regularly in church. And the idea here is for people to talk about their experiences of racism and oppression. And um, e either on the giving or receiving end, um, or just observation. And um, so the eighth principle uh, team, you know, is actively uh, requesting people uh, to um, offer their eighth principle moments, and you can provide those uh, either by email to eighth principle at uecworcester.org, or we'll also be putting uh, a form on the website to fill out um, under social justice and eighth principle. And it can either be, uh, you know, you can do this live um, uh, in person when we're back in person. Um, or anonymously too, one, one of the eighth principal team can read it. So um, I'm gonna be talking about uh, very quickly about an experience I had uh, this morning. When I was in college, my fraternity prided itself on being diverse. Um, the cars in the parking lot ranged from a rusty gremlin to a DeLorean. We had a few Asian guys, a bunch of Jewish guys, a couple of black guys. And during a rush meeting where we were talking about people who wanted to join the fraternity that year, a fraternity brother from Maryland in his Southern accent said, what we really need in this pledge class is a classy black guy. Now, I was one of the many who audibly groaned. In truth though, I think we were all thinking the same thing about needing a token, but our liberal white sensibilities made us uncomfortable actually saying it. And we were too ignorant to think about what real inclusion would actually mean.
we come to that time in our service when we're given an opportunity <clears throat> to share that which is symbolic of our own efforts and our own values. Uh, that which uh, assists us in helping to develop and maintain uh, a world which demonstrates our highest values and our, our deepest commitments and offering that uh, is to assist in the maintenance and development and growth of our mission and ministries here at the Unitarian Universalist Church of Worcester. Um, so I invite you this morning, if you are willing and able to participate in our offering by either texting 508-231-5335 or by visiting uucworcester.org slash donate. Your uh, contributions are gratefully received as we uh, continue to strive to meet the challenges of the present age uh, with the pandemic, but also when we look forward to opportunities forthcoming to uh, continue the many things we do yesterday in the midst of the frigid weather, the uh, Lowe's and Fishes food pantry team met all of our clients in the parking lot delivering um, food and uh, good cheer uh, to those in need in our community. Uh, it was uh, a cold, cold day, but there were uh, lots of smiles and uh, an opportunity to greet and meet those in our community that we are call our neighbors and our friends. <clears throat> and uh, we continue to uh, strive to raise uh, funds and awareness and assistance for families that are relocating to our community from Afghanistan. Uh, the Noor family being the most recent recipient of uh, that effort. And uh, we look forward to continuing that effort in the weeks and months to come as that ministry grows and develops and involves uh, more of us. So very, very grateful to all of you for your time, talent, and energy in these ways and in so many others uh, that continue to keep um, the vision of beloved community alive here at the corner of Holden and Shore, but also across our city, our commonwealth, our nation, and our world. This time the morning offering will be received.
We come to that time in our service when we are <clears throat> given pause to consider what is deepest in our hearts and most profoundly on our minds that we're in the work of our hands in the days that have transpired or in the prospect of days to come. Joys and sorrows that touch us deeply and are given another measure of meaning because of our capacity to share them in the midst of a company that claims us as a co-journeyer. So I invite those of you who have joys or sorrows this morning to either raise your virtual hand or open your microphone so that I may call on you in turn. Are there joys or sorrows to be shared this day? I see Laura Lenahan. Good morning. Um, first, I want to say uh, my grandmother's service went beautifully. Um, I wish I could um, thank every Worcester Police Department um, member. My grandmother's been retired for several decades from the Worcester PD, but they really took care of her. We had a five police car escort from Worcester to Paxton, and it went beautifully all the way down to her purple coffin, which she would be very happy she would have gotten. Um, and to concerns a friend of mine's family as you could see on the news um, burnt down the other night um, so they are you know without a lot but they did all get out okay and my thoughts um, for one of Rain's classmates um, who was shot the other night by the grocery store I hope um, their family finds healing thank you Thank you so much for that, um, Laura. Such tragedies and such triumphs uh, to be honored this morning. <clears throat> uh, Bruce, do you have a joy or sorrow to share today? No, no, I'm just keeping my mic so I can find others. Very good. Uh, Cheryl, Mike. Cheryl Lachey. Yes, I do. Um, I can't seem to keep my picture on. Um, as many of you know, my mother passed away last Sunday night. I was able to spend the whole day with her, um, pretty much. Um, and when I left, my sister came. We held her hand. Um, she'd been on hospice five times and graduated. There was never a woman more ready to go. Um, and she died watching the Patriots tank. So yay, mom. Um, we will be having calling hours later this week on Thursday, virtual and um, touch-free, always wear a mask at Miles Funeral Home, and um, a service is in the process. Thank you, everybody, for your support, and particularly thank you, Erin, for that prayer while I was on Facebook with her. She heard it, too. Blessings to you, Cheryl. Uh, let's see, Carol, you have a joy or sorrow this morning? I um, have two sorrows and joys. Um, my sister Gail, who's in Canada, um, is very ill with um, advancing COPD. I thought she wasn't going to make it, but the joy is that she is being weaned from oxygen now. And at the same time, I lost my drug plan and um, was afraid I was gonna have to pay my own meds until October. And um, for those of you who know Gail, she was um, an active member of this church. And um, I'm delighted to report that she is better. And now my brother in Montana has has COVID. So Gail did not have COVID. She had uh, severe, severe pneumonia. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gail. Or Carol, and our blessings to Gail and your family during this very challenging time. Um, a <clears throat> short update for those of you who have been concerned about Janet Cutman. Uh, Janet exited the hospital on Friday and is now ensconced at home. She's being well cared for by a number of people in the congregation and her surrounding family. Uh, we look forward to um, continuing to um, 
support her and to hear good news about her in the coming days and weeks. And I know that she sends her love to all of us uh, during this very trying time. As you well know, Janet <clears throat> is not a, a person who is a loss for words. And I can tell you that um, she was uh, an extraordinary presence in both the hospital and uh, in the care facility for a short time of a rehabilitation that she was in. Um, quite the extraordinary character and uh, quite the love uh, for this congregation. So we send all of our best wishes and love to uh, Janet during this time. Are there any other joys or sorrows this morning? Seeing, uh, and I'm looking to see if there are any on Facebook. I don't see any on Facebook. Oh, today is Sharon Templeman's bir birthday. So we want to wish Sharon a happy birthday. Uh, and uh, let's see, I think that's it that I have here. So let us be in the spirit of prayer and meditation. A holy one. Source of our inner and outermost being, we come today with gratitude in our hearts for our grandmothers and our mothers, whose lives and legacy bestow us with the gift of courage, the vision of hope, whose stories are ours now to tell, and whose lives are ours now to extend. We recognize that these relationships are sometimes complicated, but no less important, real, right, and more often good. Be with the Lachey family and the Lenahan family as they adjust to the absence of their beloved. Surround them with all manner of love and support and energy in the coming days and weeks. Help us be mindful of the legacies that we carry within ourselves this day. Let us also extend such energy to those who are in search of health and wholeness. Grateful today for the news of our friend Janet and for the recovery of Gail. And we especially keep in our minds and hearts all of those who continue to suffer from and with COVID-19. And keep in our deepest heart, especially those families who have suffered tremendous loss during this very devastating time. We would also bear witness to birthdays and celebrations that remind us of life's continuing movement onward for the opportunity to continue to celebrate that which makes us both human and humane. On this day, we reflect on the legacy and life of the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. once again. Help us be mindful of the work that has yet to be accomplished so that we might apply ourselves in good manner and ways to bring about the vision of beloved community that he so ably articulated in his life and through his work. For all of this and all that has gone unsaid but is no less real, right, good, and true this day, we give great and abiding thanks. Amen. And blessed be.
Begin this morning with thanks for uh, two recent volumes by Gary Dorian. Um, the first of these volumes, uh, a new Ab the new abolition, W. E. B. Du Bois and the Black Social Gospel, uh, and um, breaking white supremacy, Martin Luther King Jr. and the Black Social Gospel. They are uh, two uh, very very thick volumes of history uh, related to. Um, what we call the social gospel movement in the United States. Uh, as well, I'm uh, grateful to those who have developed and maintained the uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Research um, uh, Institute at uh, Stanford University for material that they also provide about this important topic that it's the center of my reflection this morning. Quote, let us continue to hope work and pray that in the future we will see a warless world, a better distribution of wealth and the brotherhood that transcends race or color. This is the gospel that I will preach to the world. So writes the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. to his wife Coretta in 1952. Uh, the vision of a warless world in which wealth is better distributed and where human relations transcend race or color was the radical response of what has come to be known as the social gospel movement that emerged before King and was bent on addressing the injustices and inequities that were a product of centuries of hurtful history that helped pave the way for what has been called by historians, the Gilded Age. The age when industrialization paved the way for a triumphant capitalism for the white industrialists, mostly in the northern part of the country, was an era, though, that also saw the end of Reconstruction as it was developing following the Civil War. The social gospel was an attempt, and still is, to reorient Christian theology from a myopic focus on personal spiritual development to envision a broader program for religion in general and Christianity in particular to address the injustices that were rendered on the working classes by unfettered capitalism and industrialization. The leading proponent of the white social gospel movement was Walter Rauschenbusch, a German American who pastored a church in Hell's Kitchen, New York during the 1800, late 18 and early 1900s. Rauschenbusch traced the message of practical and applied religion to the Hebrew prophets, insisting that the purveyors of ethical religion insisted on right life as the true worship of the divine, rather than simply ritualistic ceremonies. One can hear the refrain of the prophet Isaiah. Is not this the fast that I choose? To loose the bonds of injustice, to undo the throngs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free and break every yoke. This legacy of applied religion, according to King himself, left an indelible imprint on his thinking, giving him a theological basis for the social concern which had already grown up in him. That concern was also developed by the preaching of Henry Emerson Fosdick, minister of the Riverside Church in New York City during the 1930s and 40s, whom King also admired. Fosdick noted that the church that pretends to care for the souls of people but is not interested in the slums that damn them, the city government that corrupts them, and the economic order that cripples them, to which King added is a dry, passive, noth uh, uh, nothing religion in need of new blood one can hear the echoes of this sentiment in King's letter from Birmingham jail. He writes, I must make two honest confessions to you, my Christian and Jewish brothers. First, I must confess that over the past few years, I have been gravely disappointed with the white moderate. I've almost reached the regrettable conclusion that a Negro's great stumbling block is his stride toward freedom is not the white citizen's counselor or the Ku Klux Klanner like the white moderate, who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice, 
who constantly says, I agree with you in the goal you seek, but I cannot agree with the methods, your methods of direct action, who paternalistically believes he can set the timetable for another man's freedom, who lives by the mythical concept of a time and who consist, uh, constantly advises the Negro to wait for a more convenient season. Shallow understanding from people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. Lukewarm acceptance is much more bewildering than outright rejection. King was imbued with the social gospel sentiments of his grandfather, A.D. Williams, and his father, the Martin Luther King Jr., uh, Martin Luther King Sr., both who had been ministers in turn at Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta, Georgia. His grandfather helped to found the Georgia Equal Rights League and was a founding member of the National Association for the Advancement of Color People, the NAACP, its branch in Atlanta. His father asserted in 1940 that he envisioned that ministry was never solely oriented toward life and death. It has been equally concerned with the here and now, with improving man's lot in this life. I have therefore, he said, stressed the social gospel. Then there was Benjamin Mays, president of Morehouse College and minister who spoke regularly against segregation as one commentator puts it, chastising both Amer African-Americans who favored a gradualist approach to civil rights and whites who did not. As Mays put it, <clears throat> want democracy to function in certain areas or that uh, who, who did not, as Mays put it, want democracy to function in certain areas, especially in areas that involve black Americans. These are just some of the contemporary purveyors of what has now been called the black social gospel movement a history which is little known or understood even today. The reality is that much of what we call the social gospel movement was the white social gospel movement. As theologian and religious historian Gary Dorian outlines in two recently published volumes on the black social gospel, Dorian notes that the deepest commonality between the white church and the black church traditions of the social gospel is that both responded to the charge that the church did not care about society's poorest and most vulnerable people. The political economic context that gave rise to the social gospel in all its nascent forms was the corruption of the Gilded Age with the rise of industrialization and urbanization and the challenge of what has come to be known as the Great Migration. This is the context that gave rise also to progressivism and populism and the social uh, gospel. According to Dorian, all these espoused forms on behalf of economic equality and opportunity, the progressive white social gospel movement sought to clean up government, especially at the federal and city levels. To many white reformers, the domination of urban politics by capital made political rights seem useless. So they turned urban corruption and labor reform into moral issues. The agenda lifted urban and labor reforms above political rights. Interestingly enough, at the very time that African-Americans were stripped of their rights under the 14th and 15th Amendments. Think about that. The progressive and white social gospel movement at their worst, writes Dorian consented to this trade-off or simply ignored African-Americans. At their best, he notes, these movements urged that American, America only worked as a multiracial, multi-ethnic democracy that fulfilled its constitutional pledge to African-Americans. Usually they sought to democratize American society on decidedly middle-class terms, however, except when they fused with socialist and populist movements. This historic reality gives me pause, especially as I remember the words of Nicole Hannah-Jones in her book, The uh, 1619 Project. She writes, black people, however, were largely absent from the histories I read. The vision of the past I absorbed from textbooks, television and local history museum depicted a world, perhaps a wishful one, where black people 
did not really exist. This history rendered black Americans, black people on all the earth, inconsequential at best and invisible at worst. We appeared only where unavoidable. Slavery was mentioned briefly in the chapter on the nation's most deadly war. And then black people disappeared again for a full century until magically reappearing as Martin Luther King Jr. when he gave a speech about a dream. This quantum leap served to wrap the black experience up in a few paragraphs and a tidy bow, never really explaining why 100 years after the abolition of slavery, King had to lead a, lead a march on Washington in the first place. We were not actors says Hannah Jones, but acted upon. We were not contributors, just recipients. White people enslaved us and white people freed us. Black people could choose either to take advantage of that freedom or to squander it, as our depictions in the media seem to suggest so many of us were doing. Then she notes, the world revealed to me through my education was a white one. And yet my intimate world, my neighborhood, the friends I rode on the bus with for two hours a day, to and from schools on the white side of town, the boisterous bevy of aunts, uncles, and cousins who crowded our home for barbecues and card games was largely black. At school, I searched desperately to find myself in the American story we were taught to see my humanity, our humanity reflected back to me. What has been the cause of my concern throughout this reflection is the dual consciousness of being unrepentantly progressive and reveling in that tradition while becoming more and more mindful of the historic reality that progressivism in general and many of those who perpetuated the social gospel in particular while making strides for social justice were often partial in their perspective. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. reminds me that partiality in the context of the struggle for freedom is a harbinger for the maintenance of the status quo. That the way we remember our past can shield us from the very forces we continue to strive to confront because we are unable to grasp the glorious incompleteness of our own efforts. To be conscious of such tendencies does not diminish the potential of our efforts or our energy when, when we have to achieve them. What it does is continue to broaden the scope of our concern and continually critique our efforts through the lens of those lives that are the center of the ongoing efforts for equality, equity, equality, and justice. In the region of Worcester, Massachusetts, I believe that these efforts are most illumined by the continuing progress toward the eradication of white supremacy by fully funded and enforced educational reform, by efforts to continue to develop economic equity, the need for sustainable housing, reimagining community mental health, harm reduction in policing, and the overhaul of our prison industrial complex. These are just some of the arenas of public work and witness where a faithful rendering of the gospel is most necessary. Let us honor Martin Luther King Jr. this day and every day by bringing that which is the moral core of our faith to bear on a bruised and hurting world. Or in the words of Martin Luther King Jr., in a real sense, all life is interrelated. All men are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be. And you can never be what you ought to be until I am what I ought to be. This is the interrelated structure of reality. And blessed be. I'm going to invite 
my colleague and our community minister, the Reverend Cheryl Lachey to join us for our litany this morning. Cheryl, would you like to go first? I will. Please. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied to a single garment of destiny. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. There are some things in our social system to which all of us ought to be maladjusted. Hatred and bitterness can never cure the disease of fear. Only love can do that. We must evolve for all human conflict a method which rejects revenge, aggression, and retaliation. The foundation of such a method is love. Before it is too late, we must narrow the gaping chasm between our proclamations of peace and our lowly deeds, deeds which precipitate and perpetuate war. One day, we must come to see that peace is not merely a distant goal that we seek, but a means by which we arrive at that goal. We must pursue peaceful ends through peaceful means. We shall hew out of a mountain of despair, a stone of hope. Please join in place of your own viewing or closing hymn this morning number 159 actually, this is my song. to give ourselves to this struggle until the end. Nothing would be more tragic than to stop at this point in Memphis. 
I want to thank God once more for allowing me to be here with you. I left Atlanta this morning and then I got into Memphis. And some began to say the threats, or talk about the threats that were out. Uh, what would happen to me from some of our sick white brothers? Well, I don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead. But it really doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop. I don't mind. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over. And I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you. But I want you to know the night that we as a people will get to the promised land. Hey you guys, Leah here. So I must be among millions, if not billions of people who tuned in to the inauguration yesterday on January 20th, 2021. And I was inspired by every moment of it, but especially wrapped and lifted, exalted, just completely fixated and moved by Amanda Gorman's poem, her presence, her beauty, her artistry. And so this song was born. There is always a light when we are ready to see it. There is always a light when we are ready to be it. To see the light, to be the light, to raise our eyes in the dark of night, to climb this hill, together we will. Share is always your light, light in the dark. We are ready to see this. Share is always your light, light in the dark. We are ready to be it. To see the light, Let to be the light, heart to raise our eyes in the dark of night and be a gift. Together we will. There is always light. There is always your light. There is always light. Light. We are ready to see it. There is always light. There is always light. Your light. There is always in the dark. Light. We are ready to be it. To see the light. Let to be the light. To raise our eyes in the dark of night and be a gift. Beloved, I want to uh, thank you for joining us this morning. I want to especially thank the members and friends from Salem, Co Salem Covenant Church who were on our Zoom this morning. Uh, my friend and their minister, uh, Reverend Mark Nilsson, <clears throat> is away at a family gathering this weekend, a special gathering for the wedding of his son. And um, 
think it is an extraordinary opportunity for us to worship together, even as we are at a distance. And I'm especially grateful to my friends at Salem Covenant for joining us. Um, I hope that we'll have an opportunity to do this kind of thing in the future as well. And for those who continue to be on the Zoom, I hope you'll stay for uh, fellowship hour and uh, have an opportunity for informal conversation with members and friends here. Once again, beloved, worship in this place has come to an end, but our service continues next with an opportunity for informal conversation. I hope that you have a wonderful, wondrous week that you're able to pause tomorrow and remember the essence of your faith and the work of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. to join our community virtually at the annual breakfast tomorrow morning if you're so inclined. And I look forward to seeing you, if not before, at least back here next Sunday, 10 a.m., same bat channel, same bat time. Blessings. <clears throat> I'm going to...